In these sets of tutorials that are to follow, we are going to build on our basic mouse theremin. So we're going to take the basic mouse theremin, the different um, features of it. So right now we have a sign tone generator and super collider. We have a very, very simple uh, graphic user interface. In fact, it's just a black screen, but allows us to trigger notes with our mouse. And uh, well, we did actually already add um, uh, ultrasonic rangefinder there so we can control amplitude. Now this is actually going to work together nicely with our ultrasonic rangefinder so that we could um, do some different things with pitch. So in this first um, expansion module, if you will, we're going to expand these things. And I guess in, in expanding, we are going to learn a lot of concepts as we go. Uh, again, sort of um, uh, pursuing this thing where we're actually trying to build something, do something, but learning a lot of information, um, acquiring a lot of skills and information on the way. All right, so um, let's look at um, making a keyboard interface for our GUI. So right now, our mouse GUI mentioned is um, just a black screen right now. And what happens is, depending on where we are, it triggers it triggers some sort of message. Okay, so let's just have a, a quick, let's just remind ourselves really quickly, oops, for that, uh, what that is. So basically, uh, we map the pitch. So we're taking uh, the mouse X value somewhere between zero and the width of our canvas, which is 1000, which is 800, I guess. Um, and we're gonna map it to just an arbitrary range that I set up. 48 to 72, and if you'll recall, those are MIDI notes. So I think that's the C, uh, is it one octave? No, two octaves. No, one octave below middle C up to maybe one octave above middle C. All right. And then um, um, every time we press the mouse, we're sending this message pitch to Super Collider, and we're adding whatever pitch this is, and that's that mapped number right here. And that just continuously maps in draw. And we're sending an amplitude. Now, we don't need this anymore because we're going to control um, the amplitude actually with our um, our ultrasonic range finder, right? So we can actually get rid of that. Let's do a little bit of house cleaning. Let me save this as, um, uh, as this one, empty GUI with, oops, with, We'll replace that one. Oops. Ooh. It's not letting me save here. All right, okay. All right, so empty GUI with continuous pitch. And we're going to go ahead and get rid of this amp. So we're not controlling amp any longer with our mouse pressed or the, the Y value of the mouse. Um, instead, we're getting amplitude directly from Super Collider, uh, from Arduino to Super Collider. So let's get rid of that. And we'll get rid of this, these lines here. So we're no longer tracking the amp with our mouse. Okay, but keep the other code just because we might want to use that, that version, the, the click on and click off for other things, which is kind of nice. All right, now, um, right. And then just remember the triggers. So when we press the mouse, we send this message trig to Super Collider, and it's, we add the one. So that opens up the envelope, right? It sends trigger one, it opens up the envelope, and lets the, the sound sound. And when we release it, we send the message trig with a zero, and that releases the envelope, and it, it, it attenuates the sound. All right? So um, once again, we're not going to use those in this version because, let me get rid of these comments too, we're not going to use those in this version because we are um, controlling with our ultrasonic rangefinder. We're sort of using that as an attack, like a real theremin. So when we're all the way close to the rangefinder, it's it's no sounds coming out. You know, amplitude is zero. And get rid of that. You can also get rid of that one too, as well. Uh, well, we can leave mouse release for now. I don't think we're using mouse release. So we'll get rid of that. Okay. So really, what we what we want to do is we want to have uh, continuous pitch. Um, so, uh, what we'll do is we will um, have this pitch, it'll be mapped here, and then we'll just continuously send it in draw. OK, 
Okay, so it's going to just continuously send the pitch no matter where we are uh, on the x-axis, all right? So what we need to do is just copy this code here. But like I said before, sometimes it's a good idea to just retype the stuff. So I'll go ahead and do that for a little practice, even though I've had plenty myself. See, I'll set a good example. Let's see, OSC message, and we'll just call it the pitch message. Okay, and then it's going to be equal to new OSC message. So this initializes it just locally. So this is only available here in draw at this point, but that's fine because we only need to use it for a little bit. And we'll call that pitch because that's the, that's the OSC address, the thing we're sending. And then we're going to add to this pitch message. So now it's a variable that we can use once it's been initialized like this. We can use this uh, variable pitch message. And we can uh, enact a function on it called add. And that's going to add this uh, pitch um, it's going to add this pitch, which has been being mapped, all right? And then we'll send it. Okay, so uh, networks are pretty fast these days. It shouldn't be a problem, but we are c continuously sending this 60 times a second. This message, OSC message, is coming through. So the, in, in the mouse pressed version, it was kind of handy because we only send the message when we press the mouse. And we want we want want to have some kind of control later or something that does this. But now it's continuously sending this message every sixty times a second, which is is fine. It's you know, it's not a problem for the network and for the um, the computer to handle. And we can just get rid of this mouse pressed altogether. <laughs> okay, so um, so um, now we have uh, a, a, a way to to send out continuous pitch. Um, and let's just go ahead and. Uh, say that for now, and let's go ahead and look at uh, this. Um, okay, my uh, MIDI sign serial uh, code handy. I will go ahead and boot my server. I will send all this Arduino stuff, and then I'll start it now. Notice that one thing I did change here, and I think I mentioned this in the last tutorial. I did change this to trigger one, so it's sounding already automatically. <laughs> And then I, I have my my um, ultrasonic rangefinder plugged in. Now you won't be able to do this unless you have the ultrasonic rangefinder plugged in. So if you want to um, if you want to do it and you don't want to bother having your circuit and all plugged in, um, you can just go ahead and uh, um, you can go ahead and uh, just uh, you know um, comment out all this bit right here. Uh, yeah, just that whole bit, and then it won't look for your uh, your Arduino. All right, so then let's run this, and let's see if this is working right now. So it just said continuous pitch. Oh, this is the wrong one, so that's already with the keyboard. Uh, right. It should still work to send continuous pitch. Yeah, so it's continuously sending, so I can get that slide now. Okay, so we, we see that that works. Uh, let's just get rid of this super collider code for now <coughs> until later. All right, that's great. Now, the other thing that would be good to do is to create an on-screen keyboard so that we can, you know, we can actually know what notes we're playing. Uh, obviously, a keyboard is a, is a nice metaphor because it's familiar and it's like playing the piano. But, uh, of course, you can use anything you want. You know, you can use letters that say A, B, C, D, or G sharp and things like that. You can use, you know, circles, anything you want, really, any kind of object you want to be explored. You know, if you're not a keyboard player or the keyboard doesn't mean anything to you, you might try a different metaphor. So that that's nice. These sort of interactive instruments do have these little, little areas, these little portals where you can develop and be very creative with. So, you know, think about that. If this is an area, if you want to develop a totally different interface that lets you, you know, situate what pitch you're playing, that'd be great. So, but I'm, in this case, I'm just going to make a keyboard uh, as it's pretty familiar and already something that a lot of people use or are familiar with. So how do we do that? Well, um, we're going to do a couple things. First of all, as some sort of uh, initial uh, actions that will help us make our code easier later on, we're going to uh, make some variables, change some of these things into some variables, and that'll be make it handy for us to uh, do some adjustments later on as well. All right, so I'm going to make a variable 
uh, call an integer variable, int, and I'm going to call it uh, w for width. Okay, and I'll just I'll just initialize it and, and put an uh, uh, initial value right here. I'll make it a little bit bigger than our 800. It will do. Now, in order to use this w, I have to to actually make that our actual width. I have to put w in here, so the size will be w instead of 800 there. Okay. We could do height as well, I might as well. INTH, height for height, and we'll do that. We'll just keep that 600. We can probably even make it smaller, but, and then we'll just replace that there, H. So that's gonna help us later on because we're gonna do have to do some math with this. Now the other thing I wanna make variables for as well are these pitch ranges. So and that will be helpful in a number of different ways. One is, you know, we can change that pitch range up here as a variable. And then it'll allow us to sort of calculate with that variable pitch range. If we change it here, then it'll change for all the calculations, okay? So these are floats, I guess, because this mapping algorithm uh, uh, nice, likes, it's nice to have floats so you can get really accurate pitches. So we'll make those floats uh, and we'll call it uh, pitch low maybe. And and we'll make that equal to 48. And then we'll have another float, pitch high. And we'll make that equal to 72. Okay, so we can add those now. Don't forget to replace the variables in there. So pitch low and then pitch high. Right, so if, you, if you've forgotten what this does, this maps the mouse value from zero to the width. So in fact, we could continue to use the uh, built-in variable here, width, that will be w or thousand, but we can also put in w if we want. <coughs> but let's just leave it with for now. And it's gonna go from pitch low to pitch high, so we have those defined here, all right? Now in order to create a keyboard, we have to find out, you know, basically we have to find out how many pixels each single pitch takes. So if we have a distance, say, from, uh, if we want to go to change pitch from middle C, 60, to 61, we got to find out how many pixel uh, a width that is. So that'll be the width of each of our keys. All right? So uh, we'll just do a little calculation here. We'll create a variable here. We'll initialize it here, create it here, and then we'll, uh, we'll assign a value down in setup because we're going to do a little calculation in setup. Okay, and that's a good thing to do usually in setup if you want an initial calcula cal calculation. So we're going to make a float. Might as well make it a float. And we're going to uh, call this um, px per pitch. Uh, well, let's call it pictures per step or pictures per semitone, pictures per step maybe. Okay, and then we're gonna do a calculation down here. We'll do it after the OSC stuff. We're gonna say pick, picks per step is equal to, okay, so how do we actually calculate that? Well, we're gonna uh, take the pitch high and subtract the pitch low from the pitch high. So pitch high minus pitch low, right? So 72 minus 48, which should, leave us with, we say two octave range, so it should leave us a 48, right? Essentially, yeah, I'm uh, sorry, uh, 24, right? Okay, and then take that number, whatever that is, and we're gonna um, divide that into the, the complete width. So if we take the number of pitches, the width divided by the total number of pitches, we'll get the pitch per, uh, number of pixels per pitch, right? So uh, we have pitch low, pitch high, pitch high minus pitch low, and then I put it in parentheses because uh, order of operations, sometimes you have to, uh, uh, some, some programs, and I think processing does allow for sort of an automatic, it automatically detects an order of operations. I think it will do like multiplication before addition, but I like to be certain, so I just always like to put parentheses in. And it looks clear in the code anyways because we know what operations are happening first. All right, so that's going to, divide into the total number of pixels in width, right, which is W. 
So width divided by the total by, by this, these two, this minus that should give us the pixels per step. So let's post that. So print ln and we'll say px per just to see if that's actually true, if it's working. It's working. So we'll run that. And we should see it says 41 and a third. Okay. So good. Is that about right? It's about 41 pixels, 1,000 divided by 24. Uh, somehow that doesn't seem right. Uh, let's look at the old cal calculator there. So 1,000. I should be able to do this in my head. Yeah, okay, 41 and a third, or two-thirds. All right, so um, great. So that works. That means that we need 41 and two-thirds pixels. Now, pixels are, you know, because they're whole pixels, that you don't, because you don't do half pixels. That's the, the way the monitor works. We'll have to, um, we'll have to actually uh, make this into an integer. So why don't we do this? Why don't we um, make this as an integer up here? So sorry about that gone back on myself just to make it simpler and then we'll convert this here in this since we're doing all of our calculating here we'll convert it so there's a couple ways we can do use a function called round we can do that we can just use the word int and that'll essentially the same thing round was will but let's do round this will convert this into integer and we'll put these in parentheses that whole equation so that that means that this function round is going to work on all this stuff here Okay, so what is that then? Round will take this pitch, this uh, calculation, which is 41 and two thirds, and it'll round up or down according to, you know, basic rounding rules. So this will probably be come to 42, all right? So uh, yeah, so we won't print it again. I, I'm pretty sure that will work. That'll just round that, and then it'll convert it, the data type too, into an integer. So then that won't throw, throw an error now that that's just an integer. Okay, so we're gonna round that down. Uh, okay, and then now what we have to do is we have to uh, then create a keyboard based on that, right? So we know that then from 0 to 40, uh, sorry, 0 to, uh, we said it was about 42. So 0 to pixel 0 down here to pixel 42, well, just run it anyways. So that means that pixel zero to pixel 42 will all be in the realm of um, of the, the low C, the C below middle C, right? Um, meaning that zero will be, will be uh, this, <coughs> will be the actual uh, here, zero will be the actual pitch low, which will be, what do we say, 48 the mini pitch 48 and as we creep up it'll be 48.1 48.2 blah 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 all the way to in 42 pixels it will be, turn to 43 uh, 40 49 i'm sorry right okay so then that'll be our key we can we can paint it there uh, we can do something like that so uh let's go ahead and do that and we can simply do that by making a <coughs> in draw so we can label some of this stuff this sends can say this sends a continuous uh, pitch M E S S A G E O S C. Okay, and then we'll make a little header and say we'll say virtual keyboard. Okay, so since we have this pixel per step, we know it's forty-two. We can just draw a rectangle there. So I'm just going to go no fill. And this is another opportunity to be a little bit creative. You can fill them and do however you want. And then I'm going to uh, create a stroke weight. I'll say maybe three, something like that. It depends how thick you want it to look. And then we'll make a stroke color of, we'll just make it white. <coughs> and then we'll draw a rectangle. And I mean, I can use the whole screen if I want, but maybe I won't do it. I'll just have the top half or something like that. Um, we'll make them, um, so the X will be zero. The Y will be zero, so the upper left-hand corner. The width, we already said, will be the 
the picks per step. So we'll just copy that variable and pop that in there. There'll be width of our key. And then, um, <coughs> um, and then, uh, right. And then the height, it's what, whatever we choose, uh, let's say about half the canvas or maybe a little less than half 200 or something like that. Okay. So it draws a key and well, let me, let me print the pitch here so you can see. Um, okay. So, you know, we start at 48, like I said, and then we go 48 all the way to here. And that should be just about, oops. Oh, 49. I'm sorry. It did turn to 49 right there. Yeah. It's 49 right there. Okay. So that's one key. Now, we could go ahead and just do, you know, do m manual calculation. So then, you know, if that's C, I guess the next one would be, uh, ah, right. So we want white and black key. So why don't we have a fill? We need a fill. And we're going to make that 255 as well. Okay. And then we can make no stroke. That's what we'll do. Okay, so we'll have no stroke and we'll have fill, so we can have white keys and black keys. Okay, and then if we want to, we can just have a, if, you know, C-sharp is going to be a black key, we'll have a fill, a zero, and then, you know, draw another rectangle. I'll just copy and paste this for now because I'm just actually making a point. Okay. Uh, and then we'll do... Um, Right. So then we have to push it over, right? We already, we have to push it over pixels per step. So we'll go start at zero, zero. So it's actually, we're starting at pixels per step. I mean, zero, we're starting at pixels per step now. So we're starting at 42 pixels in. The height's still zero. The Y is still up at zero. <coughs> and the width is still the same. So that could be, stay the same. And the 200 height stay the same. So this is the only one changes. We just have to move it to the right slightly, right? The X has to move slightly to the right and the fill is changing. So it's a black, you can't see it because it's black on a black background. But once we put the next white key in, you'll see it. So maybe we can change our background slightly to uh, sort of a mellow blue. Um, I forgot what my mellow blue settings were. One, five, maybe 100. This would be like a purple, I think. Something like that. But yeah, maybe that's fairly bright. Um, in any case, you, you get the point. Uh, let's see, maybe it's 200 here. Uh, 100 there as well. Ah, well. Anyways, we'll just keep it there for now. Uh, I'll find out my background properly later. So you'll see there, you see there, that's uh, the black key next to it, C sharp. So, you know, we could go through and do this 24 more times. No, rather cumbersome, right? Uh, but instead, let me introduce you to another concept, and that is the for loop, okay? So I can iterate through a number of different, um, a number of different settings, and, um, uh, I can, uh, using a, um, an iterator, you know, I can just say, repeat this thing so many times and then make this slight change to it every time. And that's a much more efficient and easy way to do, draw these multiple keys. So, I mean, I actually realizing that I do need, uh, I do need a stroke because the, even the keys themselves need to be defined from each other. So we'll put that stroke weight back. Sorry for the back and forth. We'll make it three again, and we will have stroke, and we'll make that black zero. Okay, so um, let's see how that looks. Oops, ah, semicolon. Okay, well that's good. So in case we have two the two white keys together, we can tell them apart. Okay, so all right, so let's uh, just take a minute here, and I'm going to make a new patch and I'm just going to 
to show you the for loop and see what that does, okay? So the for loop, again, it iterates and it has an incrementer, okay? So the, the, uh, let me just show you the basic format and then explain what each part does, okay? So you have a for and then an open parentheses there and then you have uh, an integer, so you go int, usually it's i, and we'll start that at zero, equals zero, and then we'll have i is less than a certain number, let's say 10 for now, and i plus plus, all right? And again, let me just get this typed in and I'll explain to you what you do, and then uh, the code that it's gonna run within this for loop, okay? So uh, to explain things, basically you have an incrementer named i, and you can call it whatever you want, because you're, you're, you're initializing it here with this int. So um, I have this usually i, it's equal to zero. And then the next part of the for loop says it's gonna count for as long as this condition uh, is not true, right? So as long as this condition is true, I'm sorry. So it's gonna count um, from i zero until i is no longer less than 10, okay? So as long as i is less than 10, it will, uh, it will continue running this loop, okay? And this is the incrementer, this is what happens after each loop. So it's gonna run all the code in this, these brackets one time, and then when it comes back around, uh, um, it's gonna do, perform this action. So I++ is shorthand for I equals I plus one. Shorthand for I equals itself I plus one. Okay, and you can, you can actually write that in instead if you want to do that here. This is just a shorthand for that. All right, so then the next time, if it starts at zero, its initial setting is zero, if it comes back around, i equals i plus one, the next time it'll be one. Okay, and then it'll check, is one less than 10 still? Yes, then I'll run the code. Then it'll go back around, and i is equal to one, so it, this is just the first time it does it, it doesn't do that anymore. i is equal to one, and then i plus plus, now i is equal to two, and it'll run the code i is equal to three, all the way until i is equal to 10, and then is, I, is 10 less than 10? No, it's not, then it'll stop running the for loop. Once this condition is no longer true, then it stops running the for loop, okay? So this is handy in a number of ways. First of all, you have this increment i that is a, a variable that you can use that gets it gets incremented. It goes zero, it starts at zero, goes one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, et cetera, et cetera. Okay, and then, so if we want to, uh, let's just print line. And let's just do i. Okay, so if we, I'll get rid of that too. If we run this, you see it printed zero, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. So it ran through nine times, ten times, and it, it printed the whatever the i was for that time. Okay, so that's handy. It's good to have that. And then you can just iterate this code, okay? So if I want to, um, <coughs> if I want to say multiply by i, I can say print, you know, i times five. I can do all my fives, the first ten fives. So 0, 5, 10, 15, 20, et cetera, et cetera, okay? So there you go. So that's what a for loop does. Now, uh, you know, uh, things, these, these conditions and these um, sections are variable, so you can mess with those. So for example, if you want to start at a different number than zero, you can start at two if you want, okay? And then if I run that, it's only gonna print 10, 15 to 45. Okay, you can start at something other than zero, though zero is often the most common. Of course, you can go to any number you want here, you know, or you can have different conditions as greater than or as less than, so we can uh, count backwards, which I'll show you in, in a minute. And then you can change the way it increments. So this i equals i plus plus, okay? You can do i minus minus, which changes as well. You can do i, uh, equals, and I, f I forgot the shorthand, so I'm just gonna do it longhand, i plus two. Um, you can do something like that. So then it's gonna start at zero, go to 10, but it's gonna only do every other one. So zero, 10, 20, 30, 40, like that, okay? 
Now, if you want to count backwards, for example, that's a good thing to do. So you're going to say i equals 10 at first, right? So we're going to start at 10, and we're going to say until i is equal to um, is while i is greater than or equal to 0, okay? Because we want to count all the way down to 0, including 0. So we're going to start at 10 uh, and count down to uh, 0. Oh, right. No, we'll start at 9, though, huh? Right? And then we can do i minus minus or i equals i minus 1. And that will count down. 45, 40, you notice that. Okay. So that's the way the for loop works. So, so you know, it's a lot of flexibility. It's one of the cornerstones of any programming uh, you'll do in any language and allows us to do a lot of nifty things like what we need to do for our sketch now. All right. Uh, so... This continuous pitch sketch now needs, we need, need to draw a bunch of these rectangles and we don't want to have to just redo them and redo them every time, right? So I'm not going to worry about changing the colors. That, that's going to come later and, and we're going to learn another concept. I'm going to now iterate this rectangle over and over again uh, for as many times as I want. So it might actually be handy now to have some additional, um, additional, um, Um, what you want to call it? Sorry, uh, we might be handy to have some additional um, variables, uh, probably just one additional variable, which would be an int uh, number of pitches, num steps. Okay, and how do we calculate that? Well, we kind of already did it here, pixels per step, except we're not going to have this division, so we're just going to go uh, num steps equals. And actually, if we calculate the number of steps first, we can put it in here. But that's all right. We already did that. We're going to round it because it needs to be an integer. And we're going to do pitch high minus pitch low. Okay. So, right, if you take the high pitch and you minus the low pitch, that'll give you the total number of steps. But since they're, since they're, um, since they are, uh, um, floats, we have to, convert into an integer and also it might be that you know you might want a sort of a, a weird range you might want to go to 48.25 to 72.9 or something like that so that'll allow you to do that i'm going to use a different rounding tool there's two other ones there's one called uh, floor okay and that'll round always down and there's another one called seal and that'll always round up so i'm going to use seal because um i always want to round it up it's better to have too many too many keys and not enough keys you know the last key will just sort of fall off the screen which is fine if you don't have enough then you know you're, you'll be missing a whole key or a part of a key at the end okay so i'll put that as the number of steps okay so now that we figured out how many the number of steps now we can do our for loop all right so right now we won't worry about the the changing the um changing the fill here actually i'm going to put that down here so it, it'll be the last thing we do here we're not going to worry about changing the white and black keys just yet. What we're going to do is we're going to just iterate this rectangle with using a for loop. Okay, so I'm going to go for int i equals 0. And then I'm going to go i is less than, and this is why we needed to calculate the number of steps. N-U-M-S-T-E-P-S. -E okay, so I want as many keys as there are a number of steps in my range, right? And then I'm going to go i++. plus plus. Oops. Okay. And close that condition and then have the two brackets there. All right. And then Command T tidies up your code if you want to do Command T, it'll tidy up your code. So, um, right. So now it's going to do this, however many the number of steps are, I guess 24 times. Um, and it's going to draw this. Now, if I ran this right now, it would just draw 24 rectangles on top of each other, right? Because it was 0, 0. Uh, and they, and, but we realized that the only thing we needed to change is um, is the x. We just need to scoot it over. The width stays the same. The height stays the same. The the y location stays the same, right? So what what we're going to do this in terms of i because that's the thing that's going to change every time. It's going to go zero, one, two, three, four, all the way to twenty four or twenty three. I guess zero to twenty three, making a fully twenty four keys. All right. So uh, 
how do we do this in terms of i? We can just do some simple math to that, and we can say uh, um, it's going to be i times the pixels per step. All right. So the first time i is zero, so it'll be at zero zero with a width of pixels per step, which is you know twenty two. We said, and then two hundred. The next time i will be one, so it'll be at uh, x equals 22, which is the pixels per step, 1 times 22, 0, 22, 200. The second time it'll be 2 times 22, or 44, et cetera, et cetera, and it'll move over and keep doing it. So if we run this now, we should have a magical keyboard just appear for us. And there you go. Perfect. And for some reason, uh, our last key is a little bit truncated. I think it has to do some of the, the combination of rounding and such like that. But uh, you'll notice it, it's still OK, though. And I think it has something to do with the, um, the strokes and stuff like that. So that's still 70, and that's still 71. Okay. Wait, it doesn't quite get to 72. Because 72 is our, our furthest edge out. So if you wanted to include 72, I guess what you'll need to do is, uh, you know, increase your range. You can go from 40. If you want to include those two pitches, we can go from, let's do go to 48, but we'll go to 73 that time. There you go. Okay. So that's a real easy way to get a uh, keyboard using this for loop and a good introduction to the use of the for loop. So just hopefully take that to heart. Um, so now comes a tricky part. And it's, it's probably this is going to be a good example of some problem solving or ways to think as a coder. Not that I'm particularly versed in thinking as a coder, but, um, you know, doing some of these things, you start sort of thinking a certain way about how to solve problems sort of incrementally, really. So now we have to color in, if we run this, we have to color in our, if we want to really look like a keyboard proper. So this is C, and that's C sharp. We want that one to be black, and that one to be white, and then that one to be black. You know, we want two, and then one, two, and then one, two, you know, three black keys, et cetera, et cetera. All right? So um, there's a couple different things we can do. So first, let me introduce you to, um, I'll, do it two, I'll do two different ways, mostly for education, so we can learn about two different really important concepts. Um, um, so the first thing I'm going to do is I'm just going to use an if statement, okay? And then, uh, well, let me run this again. And I'm going to just look and see, you know, and I'll just do, maybe I'll just do the first the first octave for now, okay? So if i is equal to 1, that's my first key, I'm 0, and then i is equal to 1. So we're going to have black keys at i1, and that's i2 is white, i3, i4, I5, uh, I6, so what did I say? One, three, and six. Let's try that and see what happens, okay? Now, uh, this is one of the concepts we're gonna deal with, and that's the, the if statement, and it's, it's pretty straightforward. I'm sure you've used some version of this in, in real life, you know? So basically, if, if then statement, really. It's if, oops, if, oops, what happened here? If, okay, and then in brackets, there'll be a condition, and then uh, curly brackets will contain what happens if this is true. So if whatever's in these thing is true, then run this code here. So you can say if one is less than two, then print uh, hello. and it goes ahead and prints hello. Um, if 3 is less than 2, or 4 is less than 2, it doesn't print anything, right? Okay, so that's basically an if statement. If a certain condition is met, then run whatever code is in here. All right, and it's, again, another cornerstone. Use these a bunch of times. I've heard it said once that, you know, um, artificial intelligence is just you know, a million if statements put together. 
because you can get really complex patterns and such using if statements on top of if statements, et cetera, et cetera. All right. Um, uh, and then there's a whole, or I won't, I won't go too much into this, but if you want one important one to, to know is if you want it to be equal, so f four is equal to four, since we have this single equal sign is a, an assigner really. So when we go back to our variables, for example, pitch equals that or w equals that, it just means that w, this variable is assigned to this number 1000, right? Uh, we use the single equals. So for if statements, we need to use two equal signs. So for is equal to, I guess, is a way to think about that. Whereas this is really an assignment. It says W now has is become the is assigned to this number one thousand or becomes this number one thousand. <coughs> so that's the main one you have to remember. So if you're getting errors, uh, and it says something like here, yeah, I'll run it. It says something like it's not boolean or something like that. It must be a variable, right? I guess they they had an older error message, but the new one now says the left hand side of an assignment must be a variable. So that's an assigner, right? So that that's will come up. So if you're getting that in your code, chances are, and you'll do this a million times, I'm sure, when you start using if statements, chances are you only put one equals instead of two, because that's the way we think. So there's equals, there's of course less than, there's of course greater than, there's less than or equal to, there's greater than or equal to as well, and I think there might be a couple others, but those are the main ones, okay? So that's an if statement. If, and then, then this, this thing is, is happens okay so how are we going to use the if statement here okay well we're going to say that so this is iterating through this i all the way to the number of steps which we know to be 24 since that's two octaves 73 minus 48 is well 73 is because we're adding an extra key so we can have that last octave before we run out of space on our canvas so it's actually 25 whatever but you get the you get the idea so, uh, yeah, so we're going to add the, uh, the number of steps. So I is going to increment, so it's zero every time and one. So let's use our if statement to turn, um, change. And, oh, and then I'll show you the else, which is a pretty, pretty simple thing. So if we're going to say uh, if um, I is equal to, remember, two equal sign, and we said that, uh, one. So the second one, remember, it's it's increments from zero because I is equal to zero. So zero is white as our C. So C sharp needs to be black. So if I equals to one, which will be the C sharp key, then uh, make sure we put our curly brackets. Okay. Then this will happen. We're going to make the the fill um, zero. Well, we won't use else actually because fill's already white here. Okay, so it's going to be white unless it m matches that. Okay, so let's run that and see what happens. All right, of course we can't see it. All right, okay. All right, we will have to use an else. So we'll take that out of there. Okay, and we'll say, so uh, with the if is... Uh, command called else okay and it just and you don't need to have these parentheses because there's no condition it's just going to say if this is true then do this but if it's not true then else it'll do whatever is an else all right so then we have our curly brackets for that so if this is true we run all the codes within those two curly brackets else if it's not true then you run all the code that's in the, in these curly brackets so in this case, we're going to do fill, and it's going to be 255. It's going to be white. Okay. So if i is equal to 1, it'll be black. If i is not equal to 1, it'll be white. And there we go. So we have the one black key. Okay. <laughs> now, uh, so we're learning a lot of things here, and I, I know I'm going a little bit fast if this is your first time. If you know all these things, it's probably really boring for you. But... Um, we are sort of really building our coding vocabulary quite quickly in this one exercise. And this is sort of this whole lesson, this whole sort of course is designed this way so that we learn concepts by trying to do something. So we're trying to make this keyboard and then we're sort of building our, our vocabulary, our glossary of things that we can use. All right, so we learn if, we learn else, we learn a for loop. That's a huge amount. 
you kind of kind of do just about anything you want with just these few things. They can really do a lot of programming with just these few things. All right. So uh, to expand the if a little bit, you can have these conditionals as well. You can have add-ons. Okay. And so you can say, for example, two ampersands here will be and. So basically it says it needs to meet this condition and another condition. If one of the conditions is false, it doesn't, it's not, it's not true. So it has to meet and means it has to meet both. Okay. So, or, you know, you can string those along as, as much as you want. So what's our next black key then? If it's one, uh, C is white, C, uh, which is zero. One is C sharp. Two is D natural. So that's white, but three is D sharp. So we'll say if I is equal to three as well. Okay. Then it'll be black. So either one, oh, sorry, one or, I'm sorry. Okay, so and is that. So this will be I has to equal one and three at the same time, which we know to be impossible because it's incrementing through. So and will be, mean that it has to. So if I run that, no black keys should show up. Right, okay. So and means it has to meet both conditions. I has to be equal to one and three, which it can't be. Okay. Now, and the other one is this uh, uh, thing called or. So which is uh, these two lines together. Line, up, up line, whatever. I don't even know what that key is called. But in my keyboard, it's above the, the, the slash. The, this one, it's above that key. The, is that a forward slash, backward slash, forward slash? So two of those, which means or. So it means if either of these conditions is uh, true, then we'll go ahead and do that. So if i is equal to 1 or if i is equal to 3, we'll do that. Okay, so now that should color in my black keys. And you'll notice now we have my C sharp and then we have my D sharp, which is nice. So, uh, you know, this is one way you can go through. It's not too cumbersome. Uh, and you can just go through and do that. And, you know, that you should be happy with yourself if you just went ahead and just, you know, counted up all the keys. So the next one would be, we're going to do 2, so 4, 5, and the next one will be 6, I equals six, and then if I equals, and notice that you have to do the I equals every time, uh, six, seven, eight, you know, et cetera, et cetera, okay? And then, of course, this will be a third one there. You would you would go ahead and do that. Well, let's go ahead and put that in so we can see. I equals eight, or I equals 10. So we have our one, sort of one register there, pretty much to middle, back to middle C here. So our one octave, I guess. Yeah, so that, that works. And you can go ahead and just, I mean, it's not that hard to fill in four more and just count the, the, the keys. That's not, that's not too bad, all right? So uh, you can do that way, and I think you could, should be happy with yourself if that's the case. So, um, so however, if I wanted to make like a massive keyboard, if I have a big giant monitor and I made my the width of my thing, like whatever, you know, 2,000 and... Um, I mean, my key's really narrow and I had to make a whole bunch, then it, this might be a little cumbersome. I might have to do this like, you know, 50 times or something or 100 times or something like that. So, um, and, and this is some good problem solving. It's kind of like doing a Rubik's Cube anyways. So, and I'm, I'm just doing this fresh right now because I actually did have it this way before, but I think there's probably a, an algorithm, a little, a little trick, a little bit of math that we can do to figure out actually how to do it. All right, so, um, and we can do it by octave, okay? And I also wanted to show you this one thing anyways. Okay, so if we're gonna do it by octave, which is 12, we're gonna, we're gonna use this thing called modulo. And I'm not sure this is gonna work, but you know, hang with me and let's see if it does work. So let me introduce you to this thing called modulo, okay, which is your percentage sign, okay? And modulo basically gives you, I've never really been able to explain this right, but I think it gives you the remainder, okay? So if you do, um, uh, one modulo five, uh, let's print, one modulo five, it gives one, how does that work? Two modulo five, or it's the two, let's say seven modulo five. Right, okay, so,
Yeah. Well, anyways, uh, I I won't struggle too much to explain it, but it gives you the, it gives you the remainder. I guess the first first five are for free. <laughs> I don't know how exactly that works. So zero modulo five is zero. So I guess there is no remainder because zero goes into five. Oh, okay. I guess five. Whatever. Anyways, so the f let's just discard the first five and let me let me move on. So if I do five modulo five, there's no remainder, right? Zero. Five goes into five one time. So I guess it's this half that goes into this half. If I do six, five goes into six one time, but it has a remainder of. Oops, sorry, six. Five goes into six one time with a remainder of one, and then seven or eight, say that, it had a remainder of three, et cetera, et cetera, you know? So we do, you know, 3,000, 3, 30, 4, 5, whatever, some huge number, okay? It's going to just be, it's going to give me some number between 0 and uh, 4, right? Right. Okay, it's 3. So, so whatever huge number, I, I wouldn't be able to tell you, you know, where that ended up, but the three, well, I guess because it ends with an eight, you know, and you can change that side to be like 13 or something like that. So it's the seventh. So that's a good way to iterate using modulo. It's a good way to sort of repeat this through, uh, a pattern through, right? So in, in our case, we want to repeat a pattern of uh, 12, right? We want to do a certain case every 12 things, okay? So the first modulo... First thing, we'll say, um, instead of saying I, we'll say I, if I, and I'll just actually leave these because we might need, we might keep these there. Um, uh, right, so we'll do a kind of a combination. So we'll say if I modulo, uh, modulo 12, okay? If I modulo 12 equals one, all right? So hopefully that will do this by octave. Now I'm wondering if there's a clever, even a more clever compact algorithm to take care of just the, you know, the two, the two, three pattern. Um, but maybe it's just easier just to do it, you know, one, two, three, four, five times. You know, if I wanted to be real clever, I'm sure there's a, there's some kind of single equation that would in encounter that says, you know, it's going to do the, the second one and then the fourth one and then skip to, et cetera, et cetera. Um, I mean, I could be kind of uh, clever and say, use even odds. I suppose I can do that. But then that gets too complicated. Let's not get into that. We're just getting started, so let's not get too ambitious. So yeah, so at, at least this one will give you the functionality of doing it by octave, okay? And then once again, I'm going to put that into parentheses because that means that you want to, it to do the modulo 12 first, and then you want to see the result of that is it equal to 1, okay? So let me copy that there and replace every i with i modulo 12. So it's just going to cycle through the, the, an octave, and it's going to say, is that equal to 10? Is i modulo 12 equal to 10? Uh, right, okay, and let's see if that works. And it does. So it's going to repeat that pattern all the way. So, you know, for example, let's 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 make a huge one. Um, we'll have that 73. Let's do something like something outrageous like uh, 200. Right. So it's still there's a two, three pattern, two, three pattern all the way through. Yeah. So that's nice. 73. So even if you change the range, it just automatically does that repeats the octave for you okay so there you go so there there we have our nice keyboard uh and we've learned a bunch of concepts modulo we've learned for statements if statements and we've learned the else so we've uh created ourselves a nice virtual keyboard there and uh we've earlier made our pitch continuous so if we run our super collider code there we can um, play with the keyboard. Now you know you notice that that's like 
a thing and a half. So if we want to be really, really accurate, it's actually this, you know, is the closer to the F, just the edge of it. And then this glides up until we hit the F sharp, right? So we could, we can, we can sort of push back everything, uh, but I'll, I won't worry about that right now. Let's not worry about that right now. We'll just be slightly out of tune. Well, I mean, maybe that is something where, because if you want to play with live instruments. So I think probably is oh so we got that kill our uh, let's kill that um, right so uh, yeah so that works and it's nice and we have that continuous pitch uh, and so sorry let me let me run that one more time and just for a, a demo purposes <coughs> so if you're using your I think it's kind of an awkward location, but if we're using our ultra range finder, we can play it too. And we can add vibrato too. Okay, um, let's just go ahead and actually do that last bit, which is to sort of, in case you want to play with live instruments, sort of move everything over. And I think probably the easiest way is just to sort of change this, this range a little bit. Let me think about this slightly. So if we're mapping, it's going to go from uh, zero to pitch low, pitch high. <coughs> Map mouse X from pitch low to pitch high. So if we basically... Um, Um, let's print this pitch and see what it gives us. Oh, it's already being printed. Okay. What if we went from, you know, uh, half of the, you know, half of the width here. So we have a, uh, the number of pixels per step. What if we bend it halfway? So, you know, it's halfway through the key. So if we, uh, map that from that pixels per step divided by two. Okay. And I'll just put that in parentheses. Probably don't need these, but just in case, just so it's clear. So it's going to go from, from, I guess in our case, it's like something like 22. So from 11, which is halfway through the key, um, to, uh, so uh, this is a bit tricky. We want it to go to, um, Uh, the middle of the last key, but what if we have like half a key? So that's a bit tricky, huh? So we want to go from there. So we want to go from the total number of steps uh, times pixels per step. Right? So we want to go to the total number of steps times the pixels per step, so that'll take us to the the very last pitch, the the absolute last pitch, you know, right dead on, uh, take us to dead on uh, whatever it was, 73, hopefully. That makes sense? Yeah, the number of steps times the pixels per step. Or we can just use pitch high. Does that make sense? No, no, okay, no, we have to do this this way. Number of steps times pixels per step minus this. So minus half of a half of a pixel per step. Does that make sense? Ah, no, we have to do it plus because we have to go one over, right? So the end of the key is halfway into the next one? Right, because if we add this to the beginning, zero, it's no longer zero. It's starting from there. We have to add one to the end. So, um, I mean, simply, maybe maybe we just do it like this. We just do it 
Uh, let's see if that'll work. We'll just do it with plus pixels per step divided by two. Okay, let's just try it that way. That's probably the simplest way to do that. And if we run that, so now midway through our key right here, we're at 48. And then 49 will be about midway through there. That's right. 50 about midway through there. So it works. Let's see if the 60 works. Yeah, it's about midway. And then let's see if that works right there. And then the last key, uh, yeah, it kind of works. I think we're missing a pixel or two. I think it's adding half a pixel each time or something like that. Maybe. That's pretty much middle there. Ah, oh, so that works. Okay. So there you go. So we even corrected that. So that's really handy. Uh, so this this thing here, this pixels per step plus two is just making it so that the center of our key is the actual dead on pitch. So if we're playing together with someone, we don't have to worry about being like towards the left of our, our, our keyboard key. You know, if we had it the old way, in order to play a perfect C, we'd have to be all the way over here instead of somewhere more towards the middle, you know. All right. Okay, well, that was kind of uh, a, a, lo a lot of information and uh, a kind of interesting project, and we added on to our mouse theremin and made it a lot more functional. Now we can have a keyboard. And like I said, you know, since programming really is about um, complete customization, you know, ultimate customization, so... You know, keyboard metaphor is nice, but if you want to come come up with, you can use these same principles. And if you want to come up with a slightly different sort of looking interface, or you could you can actually maybe look at some of the tutorials, um, some of the processing tutorials, and maybe add like pitch names. If you don't know your keyboard, you can do that, or you can just have like letters sitting there without the keys or something, or you know, pictures or something like that. You know, that this is one possible way of say inventing a new metaphor of getting pitches instead of worrying about the keyboard. Uh, you know, in case you're not a keyboard player. Okay, so I think we'll wrap things up there, and um, good luck with that.